Okay. So we're good. Well, that was a that was a great discussion. Off our um, other afternoon session, on um, starting with ST Professor. Take it away. Uh, Great. Thanks for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I'm not a statistician. I'm not even a health effects expert. <laughs> I'm trained as an engineer and a modeler. Um, and as I'll kind of explain as I go through my talk, I, I started work on, on, I've had a long interest in problems of air pollution and climate change uh, through my whole career. But I, I started working on health effects issues. Um, about a decade ago, and, and that's really actually become the, the largest area that my lab is working in now. Um, Chris Ebay, on the first day of the meeting, I'm sure painted a picture of uh, the effects of climate change on health, being that there's many different effects. It's a big field in terms of the number of questions that are left unanswered, um, but a small field in terms of the number of people that are actively working in it. And so I think it's a good opportunity for us to think about getting involved there. Uh, I, again, I'm not a health effects expert, and so I'll, I'll not try to cover all of the effects of climate change on health, but I'll focus on what I know, which is how climate change affects air pollution and affects health. I thought this would be a good place to start. Um, this is a picture from a satellite of uh, Beijing. At the bottom here are clouds. These are the mountains around Beijing. And this was one of the very severe um, air pollution episodes that occurred. This was January 14th, 2013, um, that would have made front page news all around the world. And perhaps you guys uh, saw news like this. And there's been a few other ones like this. Some stations in Beijing reported more than 500 micrograms per cubic meter as a 24-hour daily average of PM 2.5. That's 20 times the World Health Organization guideline. And this is, these are some pictures of what Beijing looked like on the ground that day. Um, so air pollution is an important problem. Um, and you know we know a lot about air pollution and health, but we certainly don't know everything. Um, we know that severe air pollution episodes like this affect health and kill people. We've known that since uh, the severe episodes in uh, London in the 1950s, for example. Um, we also know that even day-to-day -day air pollution kills people, and we know that day-to-day -day air pollution, even at levels below um, the, what's currently the US EPA standards, um, also kill people. Um, as a way of uh, looking at this problem, uh, I collaborated with a number of people around the world to put together this uh, review paper that just came out last year. And we made the arguments as suggested here. Air pollution is underappreciated for global health. Um, air pollution and its health impacts are changing globally and will change in ways that are interrelated with climate change. We're learning a lot about air pollution from air pollution science, which is kind of the field I consider myself to be in. I study, you know, once we emit air pollutants, where does it go? How does it transform in the atmosphere? And chemistry is a, a big part of that. But we're learning a lot, not just from models, uh, which I use, but also um, by using cheap sensors, by using satellites to look at air pollution. And one of the, I think, the important messages of this paper, there is a need for my community, which I consider air pollution science, to work more closely together with air pollution health effect science, which would include both toxicologists, um, but also people that are in, statist uh, in statistical fields, so uh, epidemiology. Um, for these communities to work better together. Um, okay. So the plan for today, that's a little bit of background. Um, I'm going to address, as we go through this talk, three questions. They are, how many people die each year due to exposure to ambient air pollution? Um, and in answering these questions, I'll basically be using atmospheric models. So I'll take a, a, a start off by describing what we do and using models to address these questions. Second question. What's the relationship, you could say, between climate change and air pollution, and therefore air pollution-related deaths? And third, if we slow down climate change, what are the benefits that we would see for air pollution and health globally? So um, not entirely a talk about uh, climate change, but really at the, lying at this intersection of climate change and air pollution. Okay. Um, many of you know the climate models. This is a simple schematic of what I would call a chemical transport model. 
where we take uh, here meteorology as input that really comes from a climate model. Um, or if we're on a regional scale, for example, it might be a weather forecasting type of model. Um, we get uh, emissions as input and a chemical mechanism because a lot of air pollutants are transformed or formed chemically in the atmosphere. That gives us concentrations. And then a lot of the work that my group has done has been to add on these uh, um, uh, capability of assessing health impacts associated with concentrations of air pollutants. This is one framing of that where um, we're dealing with global or regional scale models and using it in a chemical transport model framework. The other framework is, you know, as you know, Earth system models that have chemistry within them. And I'll show some examples later on where we're using um, results from what I would call coupled uh, chemistry climate models where the chemistry is embedded within, uh, um, uh, within an active GCM to um, understand what uh, air pollutant concentrations would be as well as changes in climate. Um, we use then a health impact function that might look something like this. Um, this would be the function actually that we use for ozone. Um, and uh, epidemiologists would approach this from the point of view, this is the baseline mortality rate, population, and a change in concentration. Epidemiologists, and, and that leads to a change in mortality. Um, epidemiologists would be trying to estimate what beta is, the concentration response factor. In my lab, we've used this in the opposite way of using, uh, taking the concentration response factor as given, we do a risk assessment then using a model to drive the change in concentration to estimate a change in mortality. Um, I won't go through this in detail, but we've put in a lot of effort to model population and grid the data globally. We usually are dealing with uh, adult population, so this is adult population globally. And then we get statistics from the World Health Organization that tell us um, baseline mortality rates, and we grid that data as well as input to the methods that we use. And you know, because I'm interested in global scale problems here, so when we talk about the effect of climate change on air pollution, we need to account for the global scale processes that you know, are, are, are come from climate change, um, which means that we need to use a, a, a wide resolution. So this is what we get from a global model. Um, and these big grid cells then um, really don't tell us very much uh, what's going on at an urban scale. So this is for North Carolina. Whereas if we were to look at a regional scale model over the United States, we have the ability to get much finer resolution. And we can see then urban rural difference, differences that are really glossed over in these global models. So that's one um, criticism or uh, limitation of the use of global models for this uh, kind of purpose. We looked at then the importance of grid resolution in estimates of deaths, in this case, deaths in the United States. So we started from model output that was at 12 kilometers and aggregated that together to artificially construct um, grids at, at coarser resolution. And by the time we get out here then, these are the resolutions of the global models. And we see that then the estimates of death in this case are, are substantially lower when we use the, the coarse resolution. So um, if we can use fine resolution, that's much preferred for this kind of application. And for those who are interested, we can actually see that difference, right, the difference between fine resolution and coarse resolution is, is much more pronounced for primary parts of particulate matter, um, elemental carbon and organic carbon than it is for secondary. So secondary air pollutants like ammonium sulfate here and ammonium nitrate, um, they're much more uh, smooth spatially. And by the way, ozone is the other pollutant that we're, I'm going to be talking about in this talk. It's much more smooth sp spatially, so we don't see much of a bias in that case. Okay. We did the same thing, actually. CMAC is the model, so starting with the model resolution and then aggregating that up. Um, did the same thing for satellite resolution. As I'll talk about later, we get an estimate of global, actually, um, exposure to air pollution concentration at very fine resolution of about uh, 10 kilometers is currently available. Um, and when we aggregated that together for the satellite to uh, uh, coarser grid resolution, we didn't see actually the same bias. And we're still puzzled quite um, why that's the case. And so there's some more work to do there.
I'll get to now a few examples of the work we've done. Um, this was uh, my first study that had anything to do with health, which was 10 year, over 10 years ago now. And what we did there was we took a global model, and um, we were interested in methane. So methane, of course, is a greenhouse gas. What you might not know is methane also is an ozone precursor. It reacts in the atmosphere to form ozone. But because the lifetime of methane is much longer than most um, of the other precursors of ozone, methane actually contributes to what you might think of as a global background of ozone. So we were interested in understanding then, um, could we think about ozone from an air quality management point of view? Could we be reducing methane to reduce global ozone? And you know, whereas we're used to thinking about air pollution in the context of someplace like Los Angeles, now we potentially have a way of reducing ozone everywhere in the world by reducing um, methane concentration. Is that beneficial, actually, from a cost-benefit point of view? And so what we did was we took our global model, put in a 20 percent reduction of met all human methane emissions, saw what effect that had on ozone, and then overlaid that on population and estimated the lives saved from reduced ozone. And we estimated here 30,000 avoided deaths globally in 2030 due to reduced ozone. Um, when we put a dollar sign associated with those lives saved, we found that the benefits actually exceeded the cost of reducing methane in the first place. Um, this was actually, I wasn't really aware of this at the time, but the, this was actually the first time anybody had used the global model of air pollutant concentrations to do a health impact assessment. So from that point of view, we were, we were novel in a way that I didn't quite appreciate at the time. We had done other examples like that um, using our global model then to drive health impact assessment. Here we were interested in the effect of one continent's emissions on the health, air pollution and health in other continents. We showed for the first time actually that ozone from North American and European emissions causes more deaths outside of these regions than within. Okay? So ozone has a lifetime of, you could say, weeks. And so um, it can cross oceans. Um, but wasn't, what wasn't immediately obvious is that, you know, so the, the greatest impact if the United States reduces its ozone emissions is within the United States itself. But, else, but then, you know, with a much smaller impact elsewhere in the Northern Hemisphere. But elsewhere in the Northern Hemisphere, there's 10 times the population exposed to that smaller change in concentration. So you actually get this effect that um, you're uh, uh, affecting more uh, uh, lives and affecting health more outside of the region than within. Now I'll turn to our first question, which was how many people die from air pollution um, globally? Uh, and then I'll get to the questions that are related to climate, um, which is kind of the focus here. What we did in this study, um, my group was the first to use a global atmospheric model to assess how many people die from uh, air pollution uh, prematurely all around the world each year. In this study, we used an uh, ensemble of models. This is called the ACMIP Ensemble for uh, Atmospheric Chemistry and Climate Model Intercomparison Project. And so these were global models that were basically run for IPCC AR5. Mo all of these models had um, interactive chemistry within the models. We used them then in a way that hadn't been done before as a way of understanding what global um, um, air pollution uh, exposure to concentrations at the Earth's surfaces. And then for each of the models, we assessed um, the global burden, you could say global burden of disease, on, uh, on, on human mortality. So you actually get a different number. This is for ozone here. You get a different number depending on which of these many different models you use. And when we averaged over all of the models, then we get an estimate of about here 470,000 um, premature deaths associated with ozone. Uh, what we did was also kind of neat here was that we compared uh, present day simulation, which was the year 2000, with 1850 and called the difference human caused air pollution in the same way that you get radio deforcing from a difference with, with the pre industrial period. Um, and that led to this estimate here. Um, for particulate matter, it's uh, about 2 million deaths. And we had fewer models that were reporting particulate matter, but um, still about 2 million deaths per year. I'll put those numbers into context in a minute. Um, where are those deaths occurring? For ozone, um, 
primarily in over half of the world's total is in India and East Asia, but other parts of the world are not immune from that, and I'll talk in a minute about the number for the United States. Um, for PM-related mortality, about half of the world's total is in East Asia, but again, other places in the world um, um, have an uh, important air pollution burden, too. Um, the, there's been other groups that have done this, including what's been called the Global Burden of Disease Project. Um, and so some of you might know Michael Brower. His group had done a really excellent job for particulate matter. What they did was they took um, a global model for particulate matter, as we had done, but also compiled um, observations of particulate matter um, from monitoring stations around the world and a satellite-based estimate of particulate matter concentrations and then use statistical methods to meld the three data sets together in something of an optimal way so that if you were close, for example, to a monitor, you would put a great weight on the monitor. If you were far from it, you would put a greater weight on the models and the satellite estimate. Um, and using those methods, they and so I think this is the best estimate that's available today, better than what my group had done, but um, they get an estimate about double what we had published before, 4.2 million associated with ambient particulate matter pollution, about uh, 250,000 associated with ambient ozone pollution. For some context, this number is one in 12 deaths globally. Okay? That, that's a big number. Um, and, and I think it was surprising to a lot of people how important air pollution is. From the Global Burden of Disease Project, what they did that was very nice was they compared many different risk factors for health, which are listed here, and, 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 and estimated a uh, health burden associated with each of these so, such that at the end of the day you could compare different health burdens against one another. So this is high, high blood pressure. We know that's bad for health. Smoking, um, this, you could think of this as diabetes, high cholesterol. And here, number five is ambient particulate matter air pollution. You might be surprised, and I think a lot of people are, it's the most important environmental um, Factor for uh, risk factor for health globally, um, and it ranks very highly. This is obesity here. It's even more, you know, ranked higher than obesity is as a as a global health problem. So these are really pretty um, um, important results. Um, the other number that's up here is household air pollution from solid fuels. That's about estimated to be about two point million deaths per year. Um, and I'll uh, show this picture to put it in context. I had traveled some in uh, remote parts of northern Mexico and met families there. I was working on a project to um, um, help families get solar power uh, in remote places where they have no other access to electricity. And I took this picture here. This is where the woman's cooking over this fire. And you see the walls of the um, room are entirely black from years and years of cooking here. This is the problem of um, solid fuel. And she's burning wood. And there's no ventilation in this room whatsoever. Okay, so when she's cooking and she spends, um, you know, two to four hours or so every day in this very polluted environment, um, and this is common throughout the developing world uh, in India, Africa, China, um, very, very high exposures. That leads to this um, burden of uh, about 2.8 million deaths per year, so a very important and underappreciated problem. In the United States, the numbers from GBD um, for PM 2.5 and ozone, this is about 100,000 deaths per year. That's one in 26 U.S. deaths. This is more deaths than come about from diabetes, more than from um, uh, Alzheimer's disease, more deaths than from all automobile accidents, more deaths from all uh, traffic-related, uh, I said that, but all gun-related violence. So this is an underappreciated as, as an important um, uh, factor for health. In my group, had, we had done our own estimates, and Neil Fan at the EPA here had done his estimates. They're all pretty comparable. Okay. Um, some other work that we had done, I'll just show you this picture. We had um, also looked at using our model, separating out the contributions of different uh, emission sectors to the global total of deaths. Um, so here we found globally that residential and commercial emissions were most important. This is for outdoor deaths and not for the indoor problem that we just looked at, which um, would add to this total. But, um, but you actually get a different um, answer of which sector is most important 
depending on which region of the world you're in. So in the U.S. and Europe, energy, transportation are very important. In India and Africa, residential and commercial are important. Uh, industry kind of stands out a little bit here in East Asia as, a, as an important source of air pollution. Um, we also looked at future scenarios. So the ACMIP ensemble also ran scenarios to 2100, the, the different RCP scenarios. So here we see this is ozone-related deaths going down into the future, right, um, under these different scenarios, um, and PM 2.5-related deaths going down as well. There's a lot of detail there and, and a lot of richness. You know, some regions get dirtier before they start to get cleaner, um, but I'll, I'll sort of gloss over that for now as we go. The second question that I said we would address is what's the impact of climate change on air quality? So here we need to understand the physical mechanism of what's going on. Um, as climate changes, that changes obviously meteorology, and meteorology is what drives air pollutant concentrations in terms of how they're distributed spatially, how air pollutants get from place to place. It can affect, uh, and, and so there can be all kinds of different effects through meteorology and also through chemistry. Um, for example, um, regional stagnation here. So we expect under climate change global precipitation to go up, some places getting wetter, some places getting drier. But even in places that are getting wetter by and large, we expect that the time between rainfall events to increase. So more severe rainfall happening in fewer events. From an air pollution point of view, uh, rainfall is what removes pollutants from the, air, from the atmosphere. And so um, the fact that the time between rainfall events is going to increase, that would suggest increased air pollution. But as I'll show you, you really get a different answer uh, depending on where you are in the world. There's all kinds of other effects here. We expect water vapor to go up. That drives um, the uh, concentration of what we call Hox radicals to increase. Hox is what removes a lot of pollutants from the atmosphere. And so one of the things that's actually pretty certain is that climate change will cause global ozone to go down, but it causes ozone in polluted regions likely to go up because of these other um, changes. There's an interactive biosphere in a lot of models, so the biosphere responds to climate change. So as it gets warmer, trees are stressed and they respond by emitting more biogenic VOCs that goes in the atmosphere to form ozone and other things. So um, there's possibly changes in stratospheric tropospheric exchange. So, um, changes in wildfires, changes in uh, sea salt emissions from the oceans, changes in dust emissions. So all kinds of changes going on at once. All of these are hopefully captured well within a, a coupled earth system model. But the state of the art today is that the different models differ from one another in how they treat some of these processes. And in um, some, some of the models will just leave some of these processes out because they don't have a ability to, to um, handle them. So building on the study that I just showed, this is the work of Raquel Silva, who is my PhD student. Um, and um, she used the ACMIP ensemble then. The ACMIP ensemble had done um, some simulations where they allowed you to separate out the effect of climate change on, uh, on future air pollution. I'm sorry. If I go back to these, this was looking at actually the effect of changes in emission but also climate change all lumped together, and we don't know just from these simulations how important the two different factors are. It turns out that the change in emissions in these scenarios is much more important than climate change is. Okay? But here we're allowed to then uh, single out the effect of climate change, again using many different models, and we can, for each of these models, this uncertainty is given by the uncertainty in the health effect function. But then aggregating over all the, all the models, we get this aggregate uncertainty and best estimate. So we actually find that most of the models project an increase in the ozone. This is not ozone, but ozone-related deaths around the world. So picture ozone overlaid on where people live. So a small change in ozone over China has a big influence, right? Okay. So whether or not the models are doing well over highly uh, populated regions becomes an important. So by 2100 here, this is 44,000 additional deaths attributed to ozone, but a big spread that give, is given by the spread of these different models, right? But with the majority of models projecting that climate change makes ozone-related deaths worse. For PM 2.5, only one model suggested that 
um, uh, climate change would make PM 2.5 related deaths less severe. Three of the four and four of the five in this case suggested that it would be more severe, and this number is 215,000 additional deaths by 2100, um, with some uncertainty around that. But this is a pretty big number. It's not as big as the changes that I showed you before here, um, because uh, Air emissions are the biggest driver of, of changes in future air pollution, not climate change. But here we're able to signal out, uh, single out uh, a signal from climate change, which you know up till now hadn't been done using a multi-model ensemble like this. Um, this is what that map looks like spatially. This is not the change in concentration, but the change in mortality. Um, and if you look at this map, th well, that's for ozone. Let's look at for, uh, for PM 2.5, which is more important for health. Um, there's regions over Africa here that are getting less deaths, and in fact, Africa stands out as the only region in the world that's projected to decrease in air pollution-related deaths as a result of climate change. Um, and, and we think that the biggest driver is, uh, in the equatorial Africa, increased rainfall that removes pollutants. Um, but you know, elsewhere, quite big um, increases in particulate matter. Um, this is, I should say, the multi-model ensemble. And looking over different regions then, this is the range given by, the best estimate and range given by different models. Um, and so again, every world region is expected to get worse except for Africa. Just to finish my discussion here, I'm involved in a project um, with EPA funding together with Columbia University, and some of you might know Arlene Fiore there. She's the PI on the grant. And so we'll be looking at um, actually using some statistical techniques, which is one reason why I wanted to mention it here, um, looking at the effect of uh, climate change on air quality focused on the United States. And the approach that we're, what we're doing in part is, is trying to characterize what uncertainty looks like. So this concept of return period has been used widely in water resources uh, management, right? But it hasn't been used in air quality management. So we're using the concept of return period and asking what does a 100-year or 10-year PM 2.5 event mean? What does that look like? Um, and to characterize uncertainty, we're going to the big climate models. So this is from GFDL and from the NCAR model, where they've run hundreds and hundreds of years. We're using that to characterize what uncertainty looks like. Um, and then we'll also be asking the question, when over the coming century will we expect to see the signal of climate change separate from the noise of interannual variability. Okay. So that's one of the important driving questions here. Our work here is to do this downscaling. Um, for those who understand this field, we're doing what's called uh, uh, dynamical downscaling, where we'll take a uh, meteorological model, in this case, WARF, driven by the global model to downscale meteorology to the United States, and then run CMAC, the air quality model, to understand what that means for air pollution. Um, and one of the strengths of this project, I think, is we've done this kind of downscaling before, and many groups have, but it's usually, you know, the downscaling is computationally intensive. You only have the ability to downscale a few years' worth of climate data, and you usually just pick those at random and don't understand was that an extreme year or not. Here we'll take the, um, take the effort to uh, characterize what the full probability distribution looks like, and then we'll pick some from the some years from the middle of the distribution, but then some from the high end. But we'll understand that they're high end years as well as we're doing this downscale. Okay. My last question then was if the world takes action to reduce um, climate change by reducing greenhouse gas emissions, what would be the benefits of that for air pollution and for human health globally? There's actually been 20 years of work looking at this question, but our, my lab, I think, took a bit of a different look at it, as I'll describe here. To start with, um, there's two effects we could think about if we control emissions. That would, um, uh, our purpose is, you know, in controlling emissions to control greenhouse gases. And in doing so, many of the greenhouse gases come from sources that are also, you could say, dirty in terms of air pollutant emissions. So. You could think about um, what if we switch from uh, coal-fired power plants to renewable energy. That's good for greenhouse gases and slowing down climate change. It's also good for air pollution. Okay, so that's a no-brainer. Um, and so traditionally, um, 
studies that have looked at this question of co-benefits have really only looked at this branch here. So uh, you reduce greenhouse gases, what's the benefit for reducing air pollution and therefore for human health? But as I, as I just showed you, climate change has an effect on air pollution, which is this arrow here. So by slowing down greenhouse gases, we're slowing uh, emissions of greenhouse gases, we're slowing down climate change and its effect on air pollution. So our study is actually the first to, to um, estimate the net co-benefits from both of these pathways or mechanisms, you could say, and um, do it in a way that you know, accounts for the sum of the two influences and allows you to separate them out. And it turns out that, um, to skip to the results, jumping ahead of ourselves, that this pathway of uh, immediate and local effects by um, removing air pollutant emissions by reducing greenhouse gases is much more important. So how we went about doing this, we built off of the RCP scenarios. And in this case, I worked with the team, um, some of you might know them, at uh, Pacific Northwest National Labs that created the RCP 4.5 scenario. So how they created RCP 4.5 was they took what they called a reference case um, in their global uh, climate assessment model. Um, this is a global energy economics model. Um, they, they created a reference case which has no climate policy and then implemented a climate policy which gives us this RCP 4.5 scenario. So that's where RCP 4.5 comes from. We first create a reference case, put a climate policy which in the model is in the form of a carbon tax and that gives you RCP 4.5. So it's the difference between these two that we're most interested in. Um, and so um, again, the, and, and we can basically single out what's the effect of that climate policy on, um, on air pollutant emissions and then run it through our atmospheric model and our health effects code to come up with um, global health benefits. Um, to come to the results then, uh, this was published a few years ago, we had estimated for ozone then that um, you would get from this global policy to address, to significantly slow down climate change, about 200,000 avoided deaths in 2050 per year and about 700,000 in 2100. From PM 2.5, this is about one and a half um, million avoided deaths in 2100. Those are pretty big numbers, okay? Um, and so um, what, what we did then was to put, uh, look at this in the cost-benefit framework. So the, the benefit of improved health is shown in red using a high value of a life and in blue using a low value of a life. So for different world regions and the global average, okay? So the global average here, um, we're estimating to be in the range of like, you know, just eyeballing it, 50 to 300 or so dollars per ton CO2. This is the full range of, um, of uh, uh, co-benefits that had been estimated in the literature before. And we're estimating um, higher co-benefits here than had been estimated in previous studies before. And one of the reasons why, as I said before, air pollution is global. So we're using a global model to account for how air pollution moves between different world regions. Um, and, and, and in doing so, accounting more fully for the health benefits of the reductions in emissions. Um, the green here is the cost of, of, uh, of uh, reducing carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases, you could say, in the first place, as estimated by a whole bunch of different global energy economics models. So the, the solid line is the median of the 13 models and the dashed lines gives you the full range. By the time we're out in 2100, we don't really know what the costs are gonna be. It depends a lot on how much we're learning about new ways to reduce carbon dioxide. But in the near term here, we understand that the costs are gonna be somewhat modest. And actually the benefits um, just to human health from reducing air pollution here are estimated to be greater than those costs. Um, and, th and I think this was an important finding. Um, the last bit that I'll talk about, we've done some work to, as I said before, downscale this. So we're doing downscaling from the global scale, um, focusing then on the United States. This is with EPA funding, so they wanted us to look at the US, which is fine. Um, and so we ran the WARF meteorological model to downscale meteorology to the United States, and then ran, uh, that is from uh, inputs from the global model, and then ran the CMAC air quality model to understand what it means for air pollutant emissions in the United States. So uh, air pollutant concentrations. 
The effect on PM, now we have a much finer resolution than we have with the global model, so we have more confidence in this for assessing health. For PM 2.5, you see that it's spotty and concentrated around urban regions. For ozone, you see that it's pretty spatially uniform. And what's going on here is that we, we did some more simulations to separate out what the effect of reductions in PM 2.5 from domestic greenhouse gas reductions versus foreign reductions. So for PM 2.5, the driver is mainly domestic emissions rather than foreign influences, but you get some influences, for example, from emissions reductions in Canada and Mexico. Um, for ozone, actually the opposite is true. Ozone's longer lived and it has this component that is contributed by global methane. So most of the ozone co-benefits come from foreign emissions. I think Asia, for example, is being very important for air quality in the United States, but also this driver, big driver of global methane coming down in the scenario. Um, when we looked at that in terms of health, so this is the work of Yu Chang Zhang, who is also a, a graduate student with me now, uh, finished his PhD and is a postdoc at EPA. Um, when we looked at that in terms of health, we estimated actually the domestic contribution for PM 2.5 was 85% of the total, but let's not forget about the 15% that comes from uh, foreign sources. And when we look at ozone, it's actually the majority that comes from uh, in this case, it's estimated to be 62% of, of the total. Um, we put this together then, not just looking at um, avoided deaths from greenhouse gas mitigation here from this study for PM 2.5 and ozone, but we also worked with Ying Li, um, who estimated heat stress mortality um, under these scenarios, estimated about 2,000 avoided deaths from RCP 4.5 climate relative to a business as usual. This number is interesting, but it's quite a bit actually smaller than the numbers that we get up here. And I don't know that anybody has looked at these two different health effects in a way that's comparable that you could um, compare the magnitudes of the two. And so we find that actually the effect of, um, in this case, slowing down greenhouse gas emissions on air pollution related deaths is several times greater actually than the um, effect of climate change on heat stress mortality. Monetized co-benefits here are comparable to what we had gotten for the United States from the, from the global study, but now we have more confidence because we're at the, at, the, uh, at the global level. And this finding of uh, the, the foreign emission reductions being kind of important is pretty important in a couple different ways. One is that the previous studies that have focused on regional or national co-benefits, just limiting the boundaries of their studies, are probably missing um, some of the co-benefits that come about from coordinated global action, such as under the Paris Agreement. Countries of the, world's are of the world are coming together, taking action together, um, and some of those foreign actions are benefiting us in the United States, which is sort of summarized here as well. U.S. can gain significantly greater co-benefits, especially when we think about ozone more than PM2.5, by collaborating with other countries to combat climate Good. I've covered a lot of ground here. Um, we'll have time for some questions later. I think we want to go on to the break. Am I right? Yeah. Richard, yeah. Jason, isn't there sometimes a conflict between mitigations designed to reduce greenhouse gases and mitigations designed to improve other aspects of air quality? And I'm thinking particularly of the great debate over, over diesel, which for many years was promoted as, as, uh, as a more efficient fuel, and now the global health community seems to have decided that's a bad thing. So when you talk of mitigations, isn't it rather specific to exactly what mitigations are It is. About? And so we were looking at many different kinds of mitigation altogether here as represented in this global energy economics model. So the model was selecting for us the cheapest ways to reduce carbon from all different sectors, forestry, agriculture, electric power generation, industry, residential emissions, anything you could think of are, is included in the model. Diesel is a good, interesting example you point out. It turns out that most of the ways that we would think about reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and, and diesel might be an, ex an exception, but um, um, are beneficial for air pollution. But it turns out that the opposite is not true. Many of the things that we would think about for reducing air pollution would not be beneficial 
would either be neutral or slightly um, harmful in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. And, and by the way, that's what we've been doing historically, right, is putting on smokestack controls, uh, not having any effect on greenhouse gas emissions. very much for your uh, presentation. Um, so I've done a lot of work with, with people who run models, and um, in fact, everybody here probably runs models, but I'm interested in whether your model um, has enough variability in it. Um, and I'll point to a couple of possible sources. One is the demographics. Um, I noticed you don't split out deaths in terms of ages of people, uh, sex, um, and I'm interested in whether when you overlay um, population, whether you have very good maps um, of simply people or whether you have good demographic maps. So that's an attempt to get more variability through stratification. And the other way is to introduce randomization into your models. And I expect that there isn't any randomization, that if you ran that model again with everything the same, you get the same answer. Yeah. Um, have you thought about uh, either of those? No, those are good suggestions, and, and this is where our field, I think, is maybe behind what you know other fields are perhaps doing. One of the limiting factors, of course, if we're talking about the big atmospheric model, you're limited in how many times you can run that, right? But for the health effects model, that runs very fast. It's sort of a, we've bolted that onto the back end of the atmospheric model so that um, you, know, you can run that very fast and consider different factors. I think we know population pretty well. Um, there's all kinds of studies looking at, for example, night lights um, as seen from space as a way of proxy for estimating population. I think we know that well. What we don't know well is baseline mortality rates. And here we are as well projecting into the future. So underlying the RCP scenarios are projections of population. That's fine, right? I mean, we don't know what population is going to be, but those projections are as good as, I guess, as anybody. But the groups that do these projections of population don't project uh, future causes of, of death. And that's a limitation. And it would be possible to do that. Um, and so we're, we've actually included in our work um, some work that comes from the University of Denver, where they've done um, projections of what are the future causes of death under different scenarios. But we don't really know if what we're using is right. Um, it, it turns out, under those scenarios, air pollution susceptibility goes up. And the argument is, is basically that um, people are, uh, um, in the future, are expected to live longer, meaning that they're not dying of things like infectious diseases as much. Um, even under climate change, if you know, Zika goes crazy, right? Um, we expect people to live longer. And then they're dying of cancers, heart attacks, and strokes, which are the things that air pollution effects. So the susceptibility of the population is expected to go up to air pollution, but we don't really know um, how much. And I, I think we could do a lot better as a community at projecting how that will happen. Question? Probably uh, early death, not uh, in most cases, and this relates to a previous talk about the effect of temperature. Uh, if it shortens someone's life by a month or a year, I'm just curious how you include that in the model. Yeah, um, well, we use a, it, it, it's a very simple calculation. We use a, a value of a life and then just multiply deaths by the value of the life. Um, and that's the approach that tends to be used in policy in the United States. I can tell you that. Um, in the United States, the EPA values all lives the same. In Europe, they tend to uh, value based on uh, how many years of life are lost. It's a cultural difference. Not sure why, but um, it, I think it, in the United States, it actually has to do with the power politically of the uh, AARP. Um, I think that's actually true. Um, so, um, but what we've done in our scenarios that look far into the future, we have economies growing. People ought to be willing to spend more. Um, that is, the value of a life should go up as their incomes grow. And certainly, we value life more in the United States than the poorest countries in the world do today. So we would expect, as those poorest countries grow richer, they would spend more. Whether we're doing that the right way or not, 